I am on my way to the Philippines, and I am on my way on January 10th. So I am really excited. I am headed back. Um, and it has been two years um, since I have been there. I left in 2021 um, in the middle of the pandemic, and um, I miss it. I just want to start off and share my story with you. Uh, so I was actually, when I tell my story, I start on day one of my life. And I was born two and a half months early. And when they looked at my scan and they looked at everything, you know, before I was born, my ultrasounds and my tests, they actually told my mom and dad, they said, don't even bother, you know, going through this birth. She's going to die. She's not going to be worth anything. Just go ahead, have an abortion, and don't even deal with it. Well, my parents, they looked at the doctor in the face, and they said, we believe God. We're going to trust him with our baby. So fast forward to the day I was born, and I was born two and a half months early. I had a tumor on my body that was bigger than I was, and they removed my tumor. So I was four pounds, and they removed the tumor, and then I was two. At four days old, I had a brain bleed, and I had to have a shunt put in my head, which I still have to this day. And up until the age of 12, I've had nine surgeries. I've been in and out of doctors my entire life. And according to doctors, I'm supposed to have no quality of life whatsoever. I'm supposed to be in a wheelchair. I'm supposed to be mentally handicapped. I'm supposed to be disabled. Wasn't supposed to graduate high school. I did it on the honor roll. Wasn't supposed to be able to graduate college. I did that on the honor roll too. But everything, they just kept saying, she won't be able to do this. Talking, that was one of them. And if you've met me any longer than five minutes, I talk way too much. Way too much. Uh, but just everything that they said I couldn't do, walking, talking, going to school, having quality of life, being in a wheelchair, I've just outdone every sing single thing they did. And my life story is a big but God statement. Um, and so when I look at my life growing up, my mom, she's a believer, and she always said, Bethany, God left you here for a reason. Go figure out what that reason is and run after it with all just everything you have. And so I believe truly that God spared me on that day 28 years ago to be a missionary to the Philippines. So what I have done is I have spent all this time. So college, I went to college. I graduated from college. I spent a semester um, in college in the Philippines. And I have found on my very first mission trip, actually, I went on my very first mission trip, and it was actually to the Philippines. So when I heard that you guys were going on a mission trip to the Philippines, I got really excited. But I just, my whole life was growing up, and I was trying to figure out what God wanted me to do. And it was my very first mission trip to the Philippines that God showed me that I was supposed to be a missionary. So all the way through college, I was going towards this goal of getting to the Philippines, getting to the Philippines, getting into the Philippines. And I was approved by Baptist Bible Fellowship International to be an intern. And I just completed my internship in 2020 and 2021, so in, in the middle of the pandemic. And so what I just wanted to take a minute and share with you is what I got to experience in my internship. And then I'll kind of explain what I'm going to be doing in the future. But in the middle of the pandemic, they were struggling getting food. The people, they were hungry. They didn't have food. And they weren't allowed to go anywhere. They were on lockdown. And so one of the things we got to do was we got to give food packs to the people in the Philippines. And something that I learned straight away in my internship is that God uses physical needs as doors to share the gospel. And so in my time there, I kind of learned this, and it's kind of become my mission statement of why I do what I do. If I help people with physical needs, God will open the door to share the gospel. And so one of the ways we did that was we did food packs. We would pack up food for the families so that they could eat. We would give them rice and meat. And as we did that, they would come to us and we would share the gospel. And people got saved um, through that food outreach. Another thing we could do is we, didn't, we weren't able to have church um, during the pandemic. And so we had to do everything electronically over Facebook, just like y'all probably had to do here in the States. And so we would send out lessons for the kids to do with food that they could participate in church while they were at home. So one of the things I got to do was I got to build lessons for kids so that they could participate in church at home. 
And so um, those are kids that specifically um, have my lessons, and they would color them, and they would learn all about Jesus um, while stuck at home in the middle of the pandemic. Another thing I love to do is I love to teach children. The children are the heart of my ministry. Because when you reach the child, you reach the entire family. It is so awesome. And so every week I would go out into this community and I would share the gospel with these kids. Right here, we're learning about flamingos. I had to teach them what a flamingo was because they don't have flamingos in the Philippines. And we were learning that what we put in our bodies, what we listen to, what we watch, what we read is what comes out. And so we were learning gospel truths um, in our lessons every week. But just spending time teaching these kids every single week um, is something that I got to do. And it was the favorite, my favorite part of the week. This is another group. We would go to their homes, um, and the kids would just flock from the whole neighborhood, and they would sit down, and we got to share gospel truths with them every single week. And this is another group. So every single week we would go out here and we would share the gospel. We do this all over Manila. We go into the communities. And it's not like here where people, they don't want you to have Jesus in the schools. They don't want you to have Jesus in the neighborhoods. There you can go and the kids flock to you. And you can teach them gospel truths. And you can teach them about Jesus. And it is really awesome. So this is a story I want to tell you. So we would go to the churches In this church, it took us two hours by van. So we would get in the van. We would drive two hours. We would park on the bank of the river. We would get on that boat, um, which is a canoe with wooden slats. We would stand on the boat, and they would row us across the river. And we would go, and we would get in a motorcycle, and we would go up the mountain, and our church would be there. So we went out there every single week um, during the pandemic because they were closed off to the city. And we would take them food, and we would take them stuff to do church because they didn't have anything to do church. And in our outreaches there, hundreds of people were getting saved. So there's me in the motorcycle. There are so many of us crammed in that motorcycle. It's definitely a journey. (laughs) And one day on our way out, we got a flat tire. And so this is us on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. We have a flat tire, and there was nothing we could do, so we called an ambulance. And the ambulance came, and they brought us a tire. They filled it with air, and then we got on our way. Now, most people would probably give up. That was Satan attacking us right there, saying, I don't want you to go out that day. But you know what? We finally made it out to the village, and a guy got saved that day. Could you imagine if we had given up just because we got a flat tire? It was amazing what God had done that day. This is us in the back of an ambulance taking the food to that community, praising God for that ambulance to help us. I got to teach online because because of the pandemic. We couldn't teach in person as much as we normally do um, in normal circumstances. So I taught a lot online, and I would put it out on Facebook to where the kids could get to it. So the kids had access to gospel truth, Bible lessons every single week that they could watch. This is us teaching VBS. We had to miss VBS this year because of the pandemic. So we taped it all online and we put it out on Facebook and the kids got to participate. We had tons of kids get saved that week, um, all because of what God did over the internet. Like it was so awesome. I want to stop right here. So in the Philippines, there's a lot of flooding and a lot of natural disasters. It's one of the worst natural disaster areas in the entire world. And again, what I said at the beginning where God uses physical circumstances to open doors to the gospel, this was another time that God used physical circumstances. There was a typhoon that came through the area and absolutely destroyed everything. But we were able to go into communities that we had never been to before, that had never had gospel representation anywhere. And we were able to take these people food, and we were able to share the gospel of Jesus with them. And we had countless people get saved that we would have never gotten to had there not been a typhoon. So 
over my time there in a worldwide pandemic, in countless typhoons and earthquakes, I learned a simple lesson that God uses physical circumstances to get the gospel in places where it couldn't be before. And this is what I have decided to make the, bot, or the core of my ministry, to take physical circumstances that these people have. They don't have food. They don't have clean water. They have earthquakes and typhoons, and they have all these things against them countlessly all the time. They just went through a worldwide pandemic. But it has me asking myself, how can I use these hard circumstances to use that to get the gospel in places where it has never been before. This is Jervin, and he is baptizing a girl who just got saved, and that is in typhoon-infested waters. A typhoon just hit and wiped out their entire community. But she accepted Jesus as her Savior, and she's getting baptized in the same river that destroyed her house. So time and time again, God just kept showing me in my internship Physical circumstances lead to doors for the gospel. I talked to Pastor Jervin. He was the pastor of that church that was way out into the community, two hours away. Then you had to get on a boat. Then you had to go up a motorcycle. I talked to him about me going out there every single week, and I was really discouraged. I said, Pastor Jervin, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. All I do is talk to these kids in English. It's not their first language, and I feel like I'm getting nowhere. His response to me was, Bethany, they're not going to remember what you taught them. They're not going to remember what you said. They're not going to remember the games you played, the activities you did, or anything. They're going to remember the fact that every single week you showed up and you cared. And at that moment, I knew. I learned my lesson. I need to show up for these kids in the Philippines. They don't have anyone advocating for them and helping them. So I need to show up for them. I need to use the resources that God has given me. Food, clean clothes, clean water, and share the gospel of Jesus with them. And it will change their life forever. This is a boy, and his name is Paul. He is really important to me. And I met Paul 10 years ago. Paul has severe cleft palate. You can see it. Um, this, is the, this is what he was 10 years ago. So his, you can't even see his mouth right here, and it's all the way up in his nose. Unlike here where it is a quick fix, there it is devastating because Paul couldn't get a job, and Paul couldn't provide for his family. And when a man who is growing up can't provide for his family, you might as well just slap him in the face. Like that is very, very devastating to him and to his entire family. Paul came to our feeding center one day because he heard Americans were there. He came in. We saw his cleft palate. We saw that he was extremely malnourished, so we took him into the feeding center. Paul started coming to the feeding center every single day. He was getting meals. He was getting a full belly. He was going to church. He was learning about Jesus. Paul got saved. Paul went home to his brothers and sisters and he started bringing them to the feeding center. They were extremely malnourished. They started coming to the center every single day, learning about Jesus. They got saved. We noticed Paul's cleft palate and the situation that it put him in, and we decided to raise money and get surgery for his cleft palate. We got his surgery. And in the middle of the pandemic, I got to go see Paul, and I hadn't seen him in a long time. His cleft palate is fixed. In the pandemic, his entire family lost their jobs, except for Paul. He was the only one in his family that kept his job through the entire pandemic. And because we helped him with a physical need, he provided for his family for two years when his parents could not. Paul went home after he told his brothers and sisters, now you got three, four, five kids coming to church from a family. Well, mom and dad want to know what's going on. Who is this church, and why are you talking to my kids? So they started coming to church. Paul's mommy and daddy got saved. I went and visited them when I was there, too, and I haven't seen his family in over 10 years. I went and saw his family at his house. They are strong in their faith. They love the Lord. They have not once shaken their fists at their Lord in anger. 
they love their Lord. They're serving them with everything they have. They're faithful in church. They're doing everything they can to bring their friends to Jesus. All because of one need 15 years ago of a kid showing up with club palette. My heart is broken for more Pauls. I was standing in his neighborhood when I took this picture, actually, and in front of me was a pile of trash. Then in there, and the pile of trash was taller than me. Then in there, I knew the physical state of the entire Philippines, just trashed and disgusting. They don't have food. They don't have clothing. Their houses are made out of sheet metal. It's very devastating. My heart broke for the physical state of the Philippines right there. In front of me, beside the pile of trash, I actually parked in front of a church. Now, you may think the church in the middle of the city, that's really awesome. Not this church. The center of hope in the community was filled with gods. I then was broken again. Because not only are there Pauls with the physical state, you've got sewage running down the streets, you've got trash piled up to here, you've got metal, sheet metal homes that are being wiped away with typhoons and that just aren't a good place to live in. Their center of hope is filled with God. That's when I knew the state of the whole Philippines spiritually. There are more Pauls out there who are dying physically because they don't have food in their bellies. They're struggling because they can't provide for their families. But most importantly, one day they're going to stand face to face with God. And unfortunately, if people don't go talk to them, they're going to go to hell. That's why I got to go to the Philippines. That's why I got to go. And I'm really excited. Like, I'm serious. I was watching my video and I about jumped out of my chair with how excited I am. I am so excited. I've been away for two years. I'm so excited to get back. So boys and girls like Paul, they'll learn about Jesus. When they lay their heads down at night and they're hungry, or they're laying heads down at night and water's coming through their house, they have hope. Hope that not only gets them through their struggle in this moment, but they get to look forward to being face-to-face with their Lord and Savior one day. They get to be face-to-face with Jesus, and they get to spend eternity with him in heaven. So my question for you is, as I leave in less than 100 days, would you all pray for me and back me so that I can go and I can help more Pauls in the Philippines? And I will say this. I'm just going to throw this out there. My whole life and my life trajectory changed because a 10-day trip to the Philippines. Now, I'm, I'm biased to the Philippines. I will say that. But my entire life changed because of one 10-day trip. So if you're at all even, like, remotely thinking about going on a mission trip, and Pastor Chris and Pastor Tony, they didn't ask me to say this, so I'm just saying, I'm not saying this because of him, but I'm telling you, it will change your life. It changed the entire trajectory of my life going on that 10-day trip. So if you are even tiny bit thinking about going, go. I'm, I beg you, go. I'll be there because y'all will be close to me. So maybe y'all can come see me. But go. If you can't go physically, help someone go because it'll be life-changing.